so they both share the same subject, and Bach's fugue is shorter, yet it has seven times the notes and an expanded alto part? Holy moly! I'm starting to cry. Never thought that would happen in a video. <laughs> Well, hi there, and welcome back to my practice room. It's me, Penny, and thanks for joining me for this video devoted to a very, very special fugue by Bach. It's one of my favorites. It's the E major fugue number eight from book two of the Well-Tempered Clavier. Now, I love this piece very much. It's one of my favorites, and I feel like I'm entering another realm or, or sphere altogether when I play it. And I was doing some research on it a few months ago and discovered that the subject of this fugue was not in fact composed by Bach. Bach borrowed this subject and he borrowed a lot of music from other composers as I am learning the longer I make videos here. Uh, but this is a literal copy or borrowing of a subject of a fugue that was also in E major, also for four voices, from a cycle of preludes and fugues, no less, that was published in 1702, composed by Johann Kaspar Ferdinand Fischer. Now, apparently, Fischer, who was a German Baroque composer, uh, his dates are circa 1656 to 1746, and we don't know a whole lot about this guy, <laughs> uh, but he was an incredible keyboard composer, as I am learning, so much so that he greatly influenced Bach himself, George Friedrich Handel too, no less. So this is worth taking note. If it's good enough to inspire Bach, it's more than good enough to inspire you and me in our practice sessions. So I, I explored this E major fugue by Fisher, and I want to share with you some of the things that I noticed. And uh, there's quite a bit. You heard a few of those in the intro. And I have copies of the sheet music to put up on the screen in which I have color-coded the voices. Now, just a quick word on that Fisher prelude and fugue. He composed a set of, what was it, 19, I think, uh, preludes and fugues, 20, sorry, 20 preludes and fugues in 19 different keys and one in Phrygian mode based on E. And that was from a collection of pieces called Ariadne Musica. And these were for organ, preludes and fugues. Uh, the 20 preludes and fugues formed book one of the Ariadne Musica. And then part two apparently consisted of five richakares, which are similar to fugues. And uh, those were based on chorale melodies. And it was the Ariadne Musica that influenced Bach to compose the well-tempered clavier. <laughs> this has since come to be known as the Old Testament of piano repertoire, right? <laughs> Pardon the biblical reference, but this is a major work for piano repertoire, the 48 preludes and fugues. And their seeds are in the Ariadne Musica. This is fascinating to me because, as I say, this E major fugue of Bach is... It's, it's so incredibly beautiful. I weep when I play it sometimes, maybe not when I'm performing it. I try to hold it together on stage, whatnot, or in front of the camera. But when I'm practicing it, it brings tears to my eyes. It's so beautiful. And I was incredibly curious to find out more about the fugue from which Bach gained these uh, seeds of inspiration. Uh, by the way, I should mention, I, I just got some notes off of Wikipedia about uh, Johann Fischer. There's really not a lot of information available. Little is known. His music is very much neglected. It's rarely heard today due to there simply not being very many surviving copies of his music. Bach's biographer, Johann Forkel, ranked Fischer as one of the best composers for keyboard of his day. His music shows the influence of the French Baroque style, exemplified by Jean-Baptiste Lully, and he was responsible for bringing the French influence to German music as well. He was one of the first composers to apply the principles of the orchestral suite to harpsichord music, replacing the standard French overture with an unmeasured prelude. 
And we see that in the suites of Bach later on too. So the influence is obvious, right? It is big red flag on this, on this uh, Johann Fischer and his influence upon Bach. Now let's get into the fugues themselves. The Johann Fischer fugue is, f interestingly enough, is actually longer. It's 50 bars, <laughs> I need my notes, f 50 bars in length. Bach's fugue is only 43 bars, seven bars less. And yet Bach's fugue has more than seven times the number of notes. And you can see it on the page, too, just the amount of black on the page, right, in Bach's versus Fischer's. So where Fischer's fugue has 97 notes in it, Bach's fugue has 744. And I am a pianist. I'm not a musicologist or a theorist uh, or an academic in, in an analytical way. I'm a pianist. And so when I find these kinds of, this kind of information, it helps me to make sense and to try to better understand Bach's music and his style, uh, particularly for writing fugues and how it evolved from what came before. So when we look at the Fischer fugue and we see that the texture is fairly sparse, there's a lot of space on the page. The shortest uh, note value in the Fischer fugue is a quarter note in the Bach fugue, it's an eighth note. So that alone is interesting to me because it tells me, okay, Bach was trying to animate and energize the voices of the fugue to give them more independence, to give them more uh, sparkle, <laughs> to put it in a fun kind of a way. Um, I should mention that Fischer's fugue and Bach's fugue are both for four voices. And in, I mean, beyond the subject itself, there's other things that Bach maintained from this Fischer fugue. Um, and that, for one, is the number of voices, four voices. And the order that they enter in the Fischer fugue, uh, they enter in the order bass, tenor, alto, soprano. So from the lowest up to the highest. And Bach's fugue maintains that bass, tenor, alto, soprano. So there's, that is inter interesting to me. And yet, the, the Fischer fugue, I counted uh, 13 entries of the subject. 13, and the piece is 50 bars long. Now we said that Bach's fugue was shorter, right? It had only 43 bars but 23 entries. So nearly twice as many entries, seven times the notes, even though it's shorter than the Fischer fugue. This uh, is obviously evidence that Bach's fugues are incredibly dense, much more so than his predecessors. And yet their music greatly inspired him, greatly. I should play you the subject, my goodness. It's E major, and it's very spacious. When I hear this subject, and honestly, just the subject alone, you wouldn't know which fugue I'm playing. Although the Bach's fugue, uh, that subject, he altered the rhythm just a little bit. He changed some of the whole notes to half notes. But it's a very spacious subject. It, it reminds me of um, chant, Gregorian chant, or the early organ, you know, early forms of polyphony, vocal music, I could hear it or imagine it being sung in a very spacious cathedral. That characteristic, that type of sonority is maintained in the Bach fugue, although there are quite a few moments where it's rather chordal in the hand, I will say. This is the subject of the Fischer fugue that Bach borrowed. <laughs> Bach's subject. So the exact same notes, E up to A, and then down by step back to E. We'll never know why Bach made the decisions he did, right? But it's fun to try to imagine. 
Uh, my guess, given all this other evidence that we've uncovered of there being more entries of the subject, more notes in Bach, the, the alto being so spread out, um, I think that Bach changed those two whole notes from the Fisher subject into half notes so that it would create more motion. Uh, this Bach fugue doesn't have it's like one sequence in it, and it's not noty. Uh, we don't have any 16th notes in it. It's very broad and spacious. But from having played a lot of Bach's music, it does seem that he he liked energy of, of the rhythm to contribute um, to the, the excitement and drama and independence of the voices. And so I think him choosing to uh, make those whole notes into half notes gives the subject already motion under its belt before the other voices even come in. So that, uh, that is interesting to me. The entries, um, so we said that both fugues begin in the order bass, tenor, alto, soprano. In the Fisher, the voices that have the most entries are the bass and the alto. In Bach's fugue, it's the bass that has the most entries. So both of them then have a, a prominence or a spotlight on the bass. The register uh, of the notes in the first entries, so when our bass comes in, in the Fisher, it's the E below middle C, same in Bach. Uh, in the Fisher, when our tenor enters, it's the B below middle C, same in Bach. In the Fisher, when the alto first enters, it's the E above middle C. Same in Bach. <laughs> and then, of course, in the soprano from the Fisher fugue, she first enters on the B above middle C. And that is where Bach's subject enters as well. So the same range has been preserved. There's a lot of copying here. <laughs> And yet, a lot of Bach making this his own. One of the ways that he does that, apart from changing the rhythm a little bit um, and, and putting more entries and more notes, is that he uses chromaticism a lot more. There are some very chromatic passages, um, and I'll play a few of those uh, in a moment. The Fischer fugue, they're both in E major, the Fischer fugue uses 9 out of 12 of the chromatic pitches. Bach's fugue uses all 12. So it's, it's very chromatic, and uh, that, that lends uh, greater expressive quality and dissonance. When I enco encounter dissonance or chromaticism in Bach, it's, it's a cue for me subconsciously to intensify my sound, to change my sound uh, through touch and through tone and to try to bring those moments out so that the piece has an arc to it, that the performance goes somewhere, and that not all notes are played with the same quality of touch and tone. So chromaticism and Bach's music, this fugue, has some very chromatic moments. Of course, they're both paired with a prelude. That goes without saying. I did find on the IMSLP site the Ariadne Musica by Fischer, uh, those 20 preludes and fugues, and I haven't played through them, but just printing them out and sort of flipping through it, I'm noticing already, wow, yeah, <laughs> there's some other influences from this piece besides the E major fugue that Bach uh, was inspired by. So I, I look forward to getting into that. Both of these fugues use strato, and on the page you'll see those uh, marked in green. The colors, by the way, those just indicate the voices. So the blue is the bass part, the purple is the tenor, the yellow is the alto, and the red is the soprano. The green, as I say, are the stretto moments. And stretto is when we get multiple entries of the subject in close succession, and this creates great heightened drama and intensity in the music. So both these fugues have stretto, but on the Fisher only has one instance that I could find. So about measure 24, 25, 26 in there, where we get soprano, bass, and tenor overlapping in their entries. The Bach fugue has, you see, there's a number of 
green blobs on the page. Those are all stratos that, that I could find. So measure uh, 9 and 10 through 11 in, the, in all four voices. Uh, measure 16 between, and 17 between the alto and soprano. Uh, measure 19 and 20 between the bass and tenor. Measure 27, 28, sorry, 26 and 27 between the bass and tenor, measure 30 between the bass and alto. This is stretto galore, right? Uh, considering there's only 43 bars, uh, there's another one at 35 between the tenor, alto, and bass. Each of these last a couple of bars. You want to listen for those when you're playing the, the piece and, and know that they're there. Mark them in. I mentioned how the texture of the Fischer fugue is very spacious, uh, as is the Bach. However, the polyphony, the, the imitation of the parts in the Bach, is much more thick, much more active. Perhaps the most shocking and interesting thing to me, besides the sheer fact that Bach borrowed the subject, <laughs> uh, is the range of the alto. Now, I compared each of the the range of each of the voices and for the most part they're basically the same uh the range of the bass in both fugues the tenor and the soprano they're they're pretty close it's basically the same but the alto oh my goodness bach must have had even though this his fugue here reserves the majority of the subject entries for the bass he must have had some special feelings for the alto. Maybe his wife, I don't, maybe, <laughs> so who knows? But the alto in this part, in this fugue, is twice the range of the alto in Fisher's fugue. That's a statement. This is not top-heavy music. This is music where all four parts are equal players in the ball game. So in Fisher's fugue, the alto uh, ranges from the B below middle C to the A above middle C. Not quite an octave. The seventh. But in Bach's fugue, the alto ranges, oh gosh, from the F sharp below middle C to the D to above middle C. Uh, exactly twice the range, and I was counting by half step there. So an enormously uh, wide alto part there. Diminution is something that we often encounter in Bach fugues, and it is when we get the subject squished or like <laughs> occupying less space than it normally would. We don't get any of that in the Fischer fugue at all, or for that matter, augmentation. And we don't get any augmentation in this Bach fugue because it's already quite spacious. That's my guess as to why he doesn't use augmentation here. How can you augment whole notes right, <laughs> without it really sort of deflating on you? But the Bach fugue here does use diminution. And I've marked that. I found three instances within these 23 entries. Not all of them are literal statements of the subject, but to me, I hear them as a subject, they remind me of the subject, and as long as they remind me of the subject, I consider them a subject, and I want to voice them and prepare their arrival accordingly. But those diminution <laughs> sections, the first one happens in the soprano, this is in the Bach fugue, at the her entrance at the end of measure 26. So notice uh, the original subject begins on a whole note, followed by four half notes and a quarter note. In diminution, it's like it's cut in half. It take, it's squished into a smaller box. This subject entry at the end of 26. So those, the presence of those quarter notes suggest much activity and energy in that soprano part. And this is happening, notice, in the back end of the piece, in the second half of the piece. So the piece has been working up, culminating to this moment. There are strettos happening there. Diminution happens again in the tenor, that's the purple part, in 28. And in the bass, uh, that same bar, 28. And the original...
verses. This is a lot more active, right? So that lends drama and excitement to the music. Use of suspensions, we have some of those uh, in both of these fugues. That's to be expected. I have you you probably had a chuckle already at some of the little hearts that I put on on the sheet music there. This is something I do. Of course, I don't read the piece from these colorful copies. I have my Henley edition here, which I am really pleased with, and I have this basically the same markings in pencil on there with the hearts. <laughs> But I wanted to make it extra, extra clear for you. And so I put little heart emojis over some of the spots that give me great pleasure and uh, that I find incredibly beautiful or shocking in some cases, too. So I'll play a few of those for you in a moment. Another thing to note, um, in the Fisher Fugue, each of the four voices, they mind their manners. In the Bach Fugue, there's an instance where the soprano and alto do not mind their manners. <laughs> and they, they cross, the parts cross. And that happens in 32 and 33. You can see the, the red part in 32, the, alto, the soprano, rather, goes down. As the yellow part, the alto, in that bar 32, is going up. And that's followed by perhaps the most chromatic moment of the piece. And so voices crossing, that's where coloring the voices in like this can be really helpful. Otherwise, if you're just looking at it and you're not reading horizontally each part as its own line, you could treat the alto as becoming the soprano, and, and, but you're not really following the completion of each voice. So a crossover there of parts. That was interesting to me. Uh, both of these fugues have a fermata at the end of them. Of course, they're followed by another prelude and fugue in the scheme of the, the collections from which they appear. Sequences, as you know, I, I enjoy a good Bach sequence. <laughs> and usually we find a plethora of them in Bach's music. But this fugue, uh, I could only find one. Uh, and I'm no theorist. I keep saying that because it's true. I'm, I'm a pianist with some theory knowledge, using it to the best of my ability to help me perform this music. But for my ears, I hear the end of measure 38 into 39 of Bach as a sequence. Descending sequence. And that's the only one. Uh, and there are none in the fissure, so that is unique. The range of the whole piece, uh, the lowest and highest notes of each fugue, are pretty similar. Bach's fugue is slightly larger in range. The fissure fugue extends from the E to below middle C to the A to above middle C. So three and a half octaves. And Bach's fugue here uh, ranges from the C sharp to below middle C to that same A to above middle C. So three and three and three quarter octaves or so. Just a tiny bit larger. I find too from playing each of these voices, these red, yellow, purple, blue parts individually and then mixing and matching and singing them, I find that the Fischer fugue is, is a little more, like maybe static is a good word. There's not a, really a lot of variety happening. If we take, for instance, the tenor part of the Fischer fugue in measure 42, let's say. Right, it's a lot of the same two notes over and over. A, B, A. We don't see that kind of thing in Bach's music so much. We get another example in the Fisher of this rather simplistic uh, voice movement in the soprano at the end of uh, measure 36. She goes back and forth between D sharp and E. So this kind of repetition of two notes, uh, lack of variety, is, is not is not present in Bach's music. The voices are all over the place, and when you start playing the voices, 
um, you'll notice that this would be a very long video if I played each of the four voices of each fugue by themselves. So I won't do that. I'll let you do that for fun at home. But I will pick one voice for you, the alto. That's the yellow path on the page. And we're going to sample Fisher's alto and Bach's alto. Okay, so in this Fisher, fewer notes, covers half the range of the Bach, and is rather static in its activity compared to Bach. So let's have a listen to that. The alto in the Fisher begins, uh, it comes in at measure 20. Here we go. And then we have a few bars of rest. The, the uh, alto goes on holiday here. And she comes in at measure 34. Here we go. Another little holiday <laughs> comes in again at 37. So a good chunk of that alto part was the span of a fourth with a dip down to the dominant and back. Not, not very uh, adventurous and bold, but you know what Mr. B was good at? <laughs> Creating juicy inner parts. Oh my goodness, that is the fun of playing this music. Now let's sample the alto in Bach's fugue. The uh, Fischer Fugue, I think I mentioned, it was published in 1702. Bach's Well-Tempered Clavier, Book 2, from which this fugue comes, was published in 1744. So there's a good four decades that Bach had <laughs> to digest this music and make it his own, right? So let's hear that alto part coming in at measure four. And this alto... He or she does not take a holiday. She's just going to beat the band for the whole thing <laughs> and, and gets quite chromatic uh, in the second page. So let's have a listen.
I cannot resist moving my left hand, trying to coax the sound in the air when I play box music, because the voices have so much to say. And the use of rests and uh, tied notes and uh, suspensions and the long and short rhythm and the chromaticism, the interplay of it all, the abundance of the entries is just so inviting uh, to become a participant, almost like a a fifth voice (laughs) in the fugue. Uh, so th- you can see, I think it's pretty clear, the uh, the Fisher subject served its purpose. It influenced Bach to improve upon that already very lovely subject from 1702. Some of the markings in the page, let's just have a quick sample, some of my little heart moments in the Fisher fugue. Okay, so I got some hearts, mostly where it creates a kind of a dissonance. So I got one there in uh, measure 20, coming out of 18 with the bass and tenor. For a moment, everything is good in the world, right? That moment was totally recaptured by Bach in measure four. The end of three, the alto and bass again. It's remarkable how similar Bach's fugue is to Fischer's. Clearly, he he loved this, this piece. That kind of oh, resolution and, and safeness uh, created by these sounds is so delicious. Let's include the strettos too. There's a stretto in the Fisher a few bars later at the end of 24. Here's what a Fisher stretto sounds like between soprano, bass, and tenor. Versus a Bach stretto, let's have a sample to one of those. How about uh, the one at 35 between the tenor, alto, and bass? So the tenor has it first, 35. It seems to suggest more lines to me. If I flesh the the missing parts out there, 35. have our sequence there at 38. It's just so peaceful. It's gorgeous, right? So the strettos in Bach, uh, a little bit more uh, dense. Um, Getting back to the Fisher, uh, another little heart moment there at the end of 40. Uh, ah, and that arrival on 41, that's a C sharp minor uh, triad there. Uh, that minor mode, which is the relative of our home key, is very delicious, so expressive. I like to hear the tenor there. <laughs> The next bar, too. That's the downbeat of 42. We have an F sharp minor triad after that C sharp minor. Oh, it's so beautiful. Let me hear it one more time. Coming out of uh, 40.
And it's that base entry in 41 that really completes those two minor sonorities, right? No, because there's no bass in 40. But here comes the bass. I think fugal playing is for uh, people who are would like to be in a choir perhaps, but are too shy, <laughs> right? You, can, you got your own choir here. Uh, I don't need to play all of these heart moments. You get the idea, right? They're just so delicious. And then in the Bach, uh, let me uh, uncover just a few more of those. Let's see. I played you the one uh, measure uh, four. Uh, another one I had in five. So this is five here. I love the alto there, descending by step. as the soprano begins hers. And I think it's really important to hear not just the beginning of a new statement, but hear the end of it. That's what I, this piece in particular has been teaching me. Because uh, it's easy to lose the end of a subject. Just you're, you're, so, you're hearing the entry of a new one, but listen to the end of them. Uh, measure six and seven, I got a couple hearts. And here it's C sharp minor again, like the Fisher. Measure six. The clash created by the alto at the end of six into seven. Let's hear that. Middle of six. Oh, there's my alto. La. And the bass bom, bom. again. Do, do. I love that bass in measure seven. After the alto in six. And then the alto in seven has, or sorry, the soprano in seven has those little, little eighth notes there. Uh, alternating with the eighths of the alto. And that's nice to hear, too. With the bass, ah, oh, gosh. End of six. Uh, and our bass. Soprano. Bass. And alto. These little echo. And then the tenor, it's like, I want to get in on it too, right? Let me in, man. <laughs> uh, and then coming out of 10 into 11, I got another little heart moment there. This is middle of 10. Uh, bass entry, mm, strato, strato galore here. Ah. That sounds like a soap opera here. <laughs> the D sharp against the E. On the downbeat of 11. And when you're practicing it, after, assuming you notice the dissonance and have marked it in, then practice it in a very indulgent way so your ears can taste it. You notice I'm not paying attention to pulse or tempo right at this moment. I'm just trying to luxuriate in the sound and feel it and respond to it and let it move me. You have to do that separate from the practice with your metronome and all. Like that's a separate uh, type of work <laughs> than this. It's the ears need to be practiced, not just the fingers. Um, it's such a beautiful moment. I got another little heart in the middle of 21. And we had, you notice I marked in a tritone there in the uh, soprano, B sharp to E. <laughs> Woo. Uh, there's another tritone too in the, uh, between the inner voices at measure 33, C sharp to F double sharp. <laughs> Woo. That's between the alto and the tenor. And that moment, 32, 33, is very chromatic. Uh, if I play those two bars, 32. Oh, 
And then it finally resolves in uh, to G sharp minor at 35. It's a G sharp minor triad. That's a moment we've arrived. And then the rest is just the return to the ethereal sublime. So beautiful. Getting back to that heart moment in 21, uh, let's see. Oh, I love the alto going into the tenor in 21, the C sharp alto. And then the D natural in 22. Ah, a half step above the C sharp. That is delicious. Alto at 23. It's like she knows something that the rest of them don't know. And then she continues. And that D natural in the bass. Oh my God. starting to cry. <laughs> Never thought that would happen in a video. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, not sorry, right? <laughs> if you don't have those kinds of experiences once in a while, then you're really missing something <laughs> in your practicing. And whew, it's pretty powerful to have an experience like this. I'm just alone in my house. There's nobody here, you know. Um, pretty special, though. So you get the sense. Uh, it's taking this, ap this music apart layer by layer and examining it with your ear up close under the microscope so that you can understand every little curve of it and, and every little nuance and bond with it, make friends with each part. Now, I will be playing the Fischer Fugue for you. It's so delicious. And even though I've played the Bach Fugue a while back on the channel, I want to play it again in a video paired with the Fischer. I was going to do it in this video, but it got a little bit <laughs> too long. So the next video I put up, I think, is going to be just a performance of each of these. And so you can hear that subject and how it gets uh, treated by each of these composers. I'll do my best not to cry as I play. All right. I do hope this was helpful. We're coming to the end of the year. Certainly, um, whether you are a religious person or not, it's a, it's a time of year where we all kind of do a little extra self-reflection not only on ourselves and our piano practice progress, but on the world around, at large and uh, folks around us and some of the difficulties that other people are going through. Everyone's doing their best, I suppose. So be kind, be, be caring to yourself, and uh, keep on practicing. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope it was helpful. Leave me a comment if you thought it was or if you have some 
if you want to share your uh, crying experiences with while playing box music, I'm here for that too. <laughs> All right, and uh, without further ado, I will sign off and wish you happy practicing. <laughs> stay well, stay safe, and we'll see you again soon for more performances of box music and practice tips. Take care. Happy holidays. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs>